Scott, I wanted to start with you with regard to Ukraine. Uh, could you give an overview, uh, if, if you could, of, of what exactly is going on, what direction it's heading in? Well, one thing we could say right off the bat is there is no frozen conflict right now. Russia is advancing steadily on um, all fronts. Um, the pressure that Russia is putting on uh, Ukraine is uh, breaking the back of Ukraine. Ukraine has literally run out of troops. Um, one of the reasons why Russia was able to advance uh, six and a half kilometers yesterday in a critical sector is because Ukraine didn't have any troops uh, to counterattack with. Uh, they fell back to an intermediate line, didn't have enough troops. They had to fall back further. Um, you know, they sh Ukraine's used to shuttling troops around the front. Uh, they have a handful of brigades, six to eight of them, that um, are used as sort of fire brigades, uh, pulled out of one sector, sent to another sector, and they shuttle them back. Uh, when they get burned out, they pull back, they regroup, send them back in. Um, one of these brigades is the 47th Brigade. Um, the 47th Brigade was pulled out of the line, sent up um, uh, towards a uh, chest of Yar to, uh, to stabilize the situation, that critical uh, city. Uh, as they were offloading from a train, they got hit by two Iskander missiles, took out a battalion worth of men, and took out uh, a bunch of equipment. The 47th Brigade is no longer combat effective. That's their fire brigade. The fire brigade didn't arrive at the fire. Chasov Yar is burning. Uh, the Russians are advancing. When they make, when Chasov Yar falls, and it will, uh, this is going to, you know, unhinge uh, the Ukrainian defensive line, and they'll be compelled to fall back even further, putting cities like um, Kramatorsk at, uh, at risk. Um, you know, th this is what we're seeing. We're seeing this bad news all over the 31st Brigade, another one of their fire brigades, um, was supposed to launch a counterattack. Uh, the Russians instead uh, preempted it with a pincer movement. The 31st couldn't get withdrawn in time. And now several battalions of the 31st are surrounded and they're going to die. Um, that's the end of the 31st Brigade. That's two of the well-known fire brigades there, very, very veteran units with uh, you know, with a good track record of, of, of resisting the Russians. They're gone. Uh, and more and more units are disappearing like this on a daily basis. Ukraine's losing the brigade's worth of troops every day, and they're not getting more than the battalion's worth of troops as replacements. Uh, you can't sustain this military math. Uh, we are looking at the collapse is happening as we speak. Ukraine is desperate for manpower. They're desperate for equipment. So why all of a sudden are they screaming peace? First of all, let's understand that Ukraine's not asking for peace. Let's just be serious. They're asking for Russian surrender. That's their terms. They're ridiculous terms. Russia is not going back to the 2022 borders. Russia is not going back to the 1991 borders. Russia is not going to accept a frozen battlefield. Russia is winning right now. What Ukraine is doing is creating the conditions so that uh, I think a decision has been made in Ukraine that um, they better start preparing for a Donald Trump presidency. Uh, but the Ukrainians are saying, um, we, we, we need to hedge our bets right now. We need to demonstrate why. Because Donald Trump has spoken with Zelensky. Zelensky knows Donald Trump's plan. He knows that Trump is once who thinks he can solve this problem with a series of phone calls. Now, the first phone call would be to Zelensky that says, you have to accept the following conditions. Zelensky now is in a position of saying, I've already done it. I'm, I'm saying we're ready for this. We're ready for peace right now. But the conditions Trump wants to impose is, uh, is uh, the, to give Russia Crimea, but Russia has to give back Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Lugansk. It's just not going to happen. Uh, Russia, I think, is in the process of saying, uh, no, you don't seem to understand, Donald. We're taking Odessa, Kharkov, Nepopetrovsk, and Mikolaev as well. We might take Sumy just because we're really pissed off right now. Um, and that's the direction Russia's heading. I mean, when you have Lavrov say it, he can't envision a peace that allows Russian populations to be governed by the Ukrainians anymore, that's the closest I've heard a senior Russian official saying that Odessa is going to be Russian. I think that's the reality. Odessa is going. Ukraine should have taken Putin's peace plan when he put it on the table uh, back, uh, you know, uh, on the eve of their pathetic little peace summit in uh, in Switzerland. They didn't take it. And as Putin said, remember, Ray McGovern's, uh, you know, rule number one, listen to the Russians. They're going to tell you what they're going to do. And Putin said, if you don't take it, 
uh, it, it, it's off the table and you're never getting it back. And what you're going to get is much worse. It'll be the we will dictate unconditional terms of surrender. That's it. That's the only way this war ends. Trump, though, has said if Ukraine agrees to the peace formula, then he will make a phone call to Putin. <laughs> OK, and he will tell Putin that if Putin has to you know, give back the, the new territories. They can have Crimea. And Putin will tell Trump to pound sand. And then Trump's response is, we will flood Ukraine with weapons, which is what Ukraine wants. So all this talk about peace and everything, Ukraine is trying to set the conditions that will compel Donald Trump to flood Ukraine with weapons. The bad news for Ukraine is that America doesn't have weapons to flood Ukraine with. And the other bad news is, I think Donald might want to run that past his Republican uh, friends and allies in the Congress. That's sort of not the way America's headed. Our military certainly can't sustain that. But that's been Donald Trump's problem all along, is that he just opens his mouth and you know, verbal diarrhea ushers forth. And it's not backed by anything that remotely resembles reality, which brings me to the conclusion of this. This war is going to be won by Russia. This war will end when Russia decides it's over and it will end on terms that Russia will dictate not only to Ukraine, but to the West. The only voice that counts anymore is Vladimir Putin's voice. And to think that, you know, Kaleba can go to China and get the Chinese to, you know, I mean, does he really think that he can strip China away from the Russian, you know, orbit and, uh, and, 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 and turn China against Russia? Because that's sort of what Kaluba's acting like is happening. He doesn't understand that China and Russia have already worked all this out, that they know exactly what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, uh, on, on, on what timetable. Um, you're not going to, there's no light between Russia and China on Ukraine anymore. No, there used to be early on, not anymore. Um, this war is over. We don't know when it's going to be over, but it's over. The, the, Ukraine cannot flip the script on this one. And the final determination of what post-conflict Europe, Ukraine will look like is Vladimir Putin's and Vladimir Putin's alone. Ukraine will not have a vote. Kaleba won't be the foreign minister. Zelensky won't be the president. Uh, none of these people that are in power today will be at that table. There will be, it's, it's like, you know, at the end of World War II, who sat down and negotiated the surrender of Berlin? Was it Adolf Hitler? Nah, he had to put a bullet in his head. Was it Joseph Goebbels? Nah, he had to do the same thing. Was it any of those big wig Nazis? Nah, they were all dead or fled. It was General Krebs, or a German general that had to sit down and say, it's over. I am betting a dime to a dollar that when this is all done, it's going to be Ukrainian general sitting down with the Russians, signing the surrender document that Russia is going to put in front of them. Yeah, no, the, that uh, goes very well in line with Russia's stance right now that whoever is running the Ukrainian government from Zelensky to whoever else is sitting in there is, is not Val. I mean, Zelensky's time has been up since May, and Russia has not acknowledged that his leadership is, is legitimate. Dan, could you come in and talk about, too, both you and Scott have been to the Donbass. Both of you have been on the front lines of what's been going on to a certain extent. Could you elaborate also on maybe the why of what Scott is talking about? Because he said, you know, this is going to end on Russian terms. You've seen it for yourself, what's been going on there. Why is it then that uh, Russia would take such a hard stance, even as it is kind of in the driver's seat when it comes to the conflict? Yes. Well, yes. So I, since uh, the special military operations began, I've been to Russia five times. I've been to Crimea. I've been to the Donbass three times. I just got back from Lugansk uh, about a month ago, and I was in Kherson as well. So uh, what I can say is Russia will take those territories uh, not just because they're winning the war, but because, frankly, the people in those regions want to be part of Russia. That's the dirty little secret that the West doesn't want to talk about. That, first of all, these regions are historically part of Russia, particularly Crimea, particularly the Donbass, which is made up of Luhansk and, and Donetsk. These were the heart of Russia. They were the heart of the Soviet Union. 
Um, and uh, particularly the Donbass was a victim of the government of Kiev since 2014. 14,000 people died in the conflict between Kiev and the Donbass before the special military operations even began in 2022. And unless you know that history, you really shouldn't have any opinion on what's happening in Ukraine. Because the people in the Donbass know that. People in Crimea know that. They don't want to go back to Ukraine. Not because they hate the Ukrainians, but because the right-wing government that the U.S. helped install in 2014 decided it was going to go after its Russian-speaking population, its ethnic Russians. It was going to treat them as second-class citizens. That resulted, again, in a war that killed 14,000 people, and those people ain't going back to Ukraine. And uh, that's the reality I want Americans to know. And many Americans don't know what a Donbass is, right? But they should learn about it. And they should learn about Crimea and and the history there. And they would have a very different opinion, I think, of, of what's happening. And that's why those regions won't go back to Ukraine. And Scott, maybe a, a final word on the conflict or Dan, or Dan afterward. Um, what have you made of polls, recent polls coming out of Ukraine talking about how there is more of an appetite of uh, of coming to terms with Russia. Um, do you find that to be aligned with the overall uh, condition that the Ukrainian military as well as the entire society, as well as the status of the U.S. and NATO's capacity to fight this conflict? Um, um, how, how have you uh, viewed this, uh, given that for the longest time we were hearing that Ukrainians were all in on this. And you've talked about this as well, is that there has been a lot of, um, you know, fervor and passion for, you know, joining on the front, you know, joining the front lines and essentially dying for this cause. Well, I mean, first of all, we can't dispute the fact that there are um, tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers who believe in Ukraine and are willing to fight and die for Ukraine. Um, every Russian officer and soldier I spoke to uh, who was in the special military operation had nothing but praise for the Ukra their Ukrainian counterparts, the bravery of these men, uh, the tenacity of these men, um, uh, and the respect they have for people who are willing to fight to the death for what they, what they believe in. I mean, you know, it's war is war, but, you know, they, the Russians, you, you don't hear the Russian soldiers uh, saying these guys are a bunch of cowards or useless. No, they're like, no, if we don't watch what we do, they're going to, they, they kill us because uh, they're, they're pretty good. Um, you know, so there's, there's people out there that, that are fighting. We should never forget that point that the Ukrainians are putting up a hell of a fight uh, against a very good Russian army. Um but they're they're running out of out of troops. Um, but here's the thing, and and maybe Dan can talk about this too, um, because you know he's he's been to Russia a lot more times than I have, um, and I think he probably has a broader uh, uh, you know base of uh, experience to draw upon. But my my more narrow uh, base um, has me comparing and contrasting, even as recent as May of last year, 2023. Um, what I would call sympathy in Russia for the Ukrainians, empathy even, um, uh, compassion. Uh, there was not, um, the Russian people weren't hard against the Ukrainians. They, they were still coming to grips with this war, but it was mainly their ire was directed towards NATO, towards the West, uh, and, and they weren't holding Ukraine accountable for that. Um, I don't think that that situation exists today. This is my take. And again, Dan can correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm willing to be wrong because I don't claim to know everything about Russia. But my sense is that there's been a hardening of Russia towards the Ukrainians um, and that the, 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 the direction that the Russian people are is finish this war regardless of the cost to Ukraine. And they're not asking for war crimes. They're not asking for this. But the day of worrying about, you know, the you know the suffering of the Ukrainian people is is long past. The Russians have buried too many Russians. Um, 
and they just they, they want this war to end and they don't care which to, the reason why I brought that up is the, the polls don't matter anymore Russia doesn't care anymore there was a time when polls like that might have resonated inside Russia generated some discussion but from my perspective uh, the Russian people have just become hard look I've seen it even here in the United States I've, I've watched the uh, attitude of the uh, Russian ambassador and the Russian embassy shift dramatically from a time when their number one priority was how to convince, how to get the American people um, inoculated against the disease of uh, of Russophobia. Uh, they you know they wanted to win the hearts and minds of the American people. They want, and today it, they don't care. They don't give a damn about us. I mean, they're they're just like the hell with you. Uh, we. I mean, I, it, it's just this callous indifference that comes when, you know, when recognizing that the United States um, collectively is unwilling to engage in constructive dialogue, unwilling to engage in anything that brings about, you know, a mutually acceptable conclusion. Therefore, Russia will go its own way. And that's what's happened. I think the Russian people have just said, no, nah, we don't care. Ukraine's the hell with you. Finish this war. And the the Russian diplomats are saying, look, America doesn't want to be constructive, doesn't want to engage in the hell with America. I, I don't think the Russians are losing too much sleep about Russophobia in America today. Uh, I, I think they're like, yep, that's a disease. It's like hydrophobia. Let it kill America. We don't care anymore. We've moved on. We got BRICS. We got Eurasia. We've got all this other stuff happening that's expanding our uh, interaction in the world today. And I'll, I'll just leave you with one last uh, observation that was just a very fascinating observation I got from a Russian um, um, professor uh, recently. Normally, I, when I interview Russians, it's the, the, the purpose of it is it going back to my idea of trying to inoculate Americans against Russophobia is to get the Russian perspective about Russia so they can empower me, empower people who are listening so we have an understanding about Russia. But I decided that given what was happening in America, I wanted to get the Russian perspective about my country, what was going on. And the most fascinating observation was made. And it's one that I think everybody should uh, reflect on. He said that um, he was a man who was alive when the Soviet Union fell. He was a man that experienced um, you know, the Soviet Union during the latter stages of perestroika, the collapse of Soviet society. And he said, when we look at America today, we see the Soviet Union at the end of perestroika. We're seeing the collapse of American society. And I was taken aback. I'm like, no, 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 no. What the hell are you talking about? And then I reflect on it. This election is crazy. An assassination attempt that, that may have been orchestrated by elements of the U.S. government. Um, a soft coup that was definitely orchestrated by elements of the U.S. government the weaponization of a judiciary, society firmly divided, $36 trillion in debt, unsustainable economic. Again, it's right. Again, Ray McGovern always said, listen to the Russians. They'll tell you something, and you, and, and, and you, should, you, should, you should keep it in mind. The Russians are looking at America today, and there's a reason why they don't necessarily – want to work with us anymore because they see a society that's in a death spiral and um, it's a tragedy for them. They, they, they used to love the American respect the America of 20 years ago, but today they look at America and it's like watching an, an old sick animal, you know, uh, perish in the field. Um, you can't save it. It's going to die. And it's a tragedy because at one time you love that animal. Russia's looking at America and they're watching us die. And for an American who loves my country, that was a very, very difficult uh, observation to hear and a more difficult reality to start uh, acknowledging as I reflected on what the guy said. Yes, Dan. Uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, final final comment on, you know, I know Scott uh, wanted to bring you in. So final word before and then we'll go over some super chats and, and close. Up, oh, you're muted. Up oh, there, yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah. So, I, and I, I will. Uh, after I end my remarks, I will go. It's five thirty in the morning here, so I, I'm, I'm about <laughs> to begin my day. Um, but I will just end. I first of all, I agree, Scott, with everything you said. Um, 
And what I'll say is that one of the great tragedies here is that Russia wanted to be part of the West, wanted to be part of Europe, dating back to Peter the Great, right? And the Russians fully thought after, after the Soviet Union collapsed that they would be admitted back into the West and into, into Europe. And it wasn't Russia that decided that that wasn't going to happen. It was the West that, turned, that said, no, we don't want you. And um, it took a long time for the Russians to wake up to the fact that they weren't wanted by the West. Um, and they know that now. And as you say, they, they could live without us now. They will in the end forgive us. They're a very forgiving people. We will be friends again, as we've been historically. You know, the Russians supported the Revolutionary War, supported Lincoln in the Civil War, of course, played a huge role in, in, in defeating the Nazis in World War II. Russia should be our friend. But, but they could live without us now because they know how much the West hates them. And it's a terrible thing. But um, at the end of the day, we will deal with Russia again and they will deal with us. Um, but it will be on different terms. They will not come back as beggars. That's for sure. And they will demand respect, which they deserve, of course. Um, and we will have to learn to respect them.